Hey everyone. Uh, so my name is Yoav Weiss. I'm a, a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation. And uh, I'm on a mission to uh, eliminate EOAs or externally owned accounts. So I'm going to talk about, uh, how, about how and why. So what is account obstruction? To understand account obstruction, we need to understand what we had until now and uh, what's wrong with it. So, the, uh, so most accounts today are externally owned accounts, also called uh, EOA. And these accounts have a single key. Uh, so this, they have a single ECDSA key hard-coded to the account. You cannot change the key. You cannot make any. Uh, you, ca you cannot have it any other ways. And that's uh, generally a problem because keys get stolen or lost all the time. And if you lose your key, if you lose your key or someone gets a hold of it, then you're in trouble. Um, it's also an uh, all-or-nothing proposition. If your key. Uh, uh, so if, uh, if you have the key, you can do everything in the account. You have full control. And if you don't have the key, you can't do anything. There is no, uh, there's no granular access control. So basically, in security, usually we separate between uh, authentication and authorization. But here we, have, uh, we don't have this separation. It's, uh, the authorization is, uh, is just a Boolean. Another issue is uh, gas payment. With an EOA, uh, with an EOA, the gas must be paid uh, out of the account itself, and uh, so it's not uh, great. It's not great for onboarding because you need to transfer ETH into the account, in, on, in order to uh, start using it. It's also not great for privacy, because it's not great for privacy because you need to associate your uh, new account with an existing account by transferring Ether into it. And uh, it's not flexible for, uh, for dApps because one, one operation is one transaction. For example, uh, when you need to uh, perform a trade with an ERC-20, you send one transaction for approve and another one for transfer from. And it's impossible to automate any flows because you have to, uh, you, you have to sign any operation in the account. Account obstruction offers an alternative. It offers us a way to uh, to create a to create an, a flexible account, where um, they have a flexible account where that uh, matches the user's needs. And for different users, it can mean uh, different things. For uh, for a new user, we would like to just give uh, the same uh, to give something similar to a bank account. When you're using a bank account. Uh, using your online banking, you are not uh, you are not worried that if you lose your password, you will lose your bank account. You can always uh, you can always call the bank, and they would help you recover it. So we should give them something similar, and we we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't expect new users to uh, to write down uh, 12 words uh, on a paper and to uh, keep them safe. Users shouldn't see cryptographic keys because they don't uh, know how to manage them. So we need, to, we need to add devices to the account. Let's say your mobile device is, a, is how you control your account and you can have a, a backup device. You shouldn't have to manage keys. For a more sophisticated user, uh, it, can be a, it, can mean something, uh, it can mean something different. It can mean having extra features, extra flexibility. For example, uh, you could have access policies saying that uh, from your mobile device you can spend up to a thousand dollars and if you want to spend uh, if you want to spend uh, like a double that then you can use a 2fa and if you want to spend an unlimited amount then you should go get your hardware wallet your ledger or something from uh, from your safe so with the count obstruction you can add this kind of flexibility but what's great is that you can have this uh, that it can evolve with you you can start as a new user and have something as simple as you like, and then and, and then later have something as complex as you like, adding uh, adding features by changing the implementation in place. Another thing it uh, another thing it solves is that uh, gas payment becomes flexible. Basically, any contract anyone can pay can pay for the gas. It doesn't have to come from the account itself. So the account could pay for its own gas. 
or a third party could do it. For example, a DAP could uh, sponsor its user's transaction when, it, uh, transact, when, when the user transacts with a specific contract, or uh, the, user could, uh, the user could pay uh, with, ERC t with ERC20 tokens, and then uh, and a paymaster will convert it automatically and pay with Ether. That's also great for a cross-chain because even if you have Ether, maybe you want to transact on another chain where you don't have the native currency. It's, uh, it's useful for privacy because uh, you could have a paymaster that, uh, helps you pay for the, that helps you pay for the gas when using a new account so you don't have to associate the, the, the new account with an old one. And it's, uh, it's great for dApps. Uh, dApps, can have, uh, dApps can have a lot of flexibility when uh, using such accounts. Uh, the low-hanging fruit is, of course, batching. So uh, you can have multiple operations in a single transaction. For example, uh, this uh, approve and a uh, transfer from flow becomes one transaction. You can, add, uh, you can add a lot more things, such as uh, session keys, which means uh, if, you want to, uh, if you want to use your, uh, to use your account, with a game and you don't want to sign a transaction, you, you don't want to sign every operation in the game while you are using uh, your NFT, for example, in this uh, game, then uh, you want to give the key to your browser and the browser will sign on your behalf. But you, don't want your, but you don't want your browser to be able to transfer your assets. So you could add another key to the account, which is generated in your browser, and you say that this key is only allowed to transact with the game. It cannot, it cannot transfer any assets. So then you get much better UX without having to, uh, without having to take a risk. And since the, um, since the operation can be done, we separated the authentication from authorization, so, the op so operations can be triggered by, any, uh, by, uh, by anyone who is authorized to do it, not necessarily by the owner. It allows us to automate certain things, such as uh, recurring payments, where someone charges you a monthly fee and they don't need to sign it, to, you don't need to sign it every time, or you can uh, check uh, certain criteria, such as uh, to perform a, to perform a trade of a, to trade a certain token only when it reaches a certain price, and you, and you don't need to watch your uh, to sit at your computer and wait for this price in order to sign a transaction. Instead, you set the conditions in your account, and then a DAP or anyone else actually. Can trigger, can trigger your account to perform the trade only if the conditions are met. And why is it called account abstraction? So that's not a great name. It's a, the name was given to it by protocol developers, not by users. And what's being abstracted is all the aspects, that, uh, all the aspects of uh, implementing an account, which means the, uh, the authentication, the, uh, the cryptographic signature, the replay protection, and, uh, Every, the gas payment, it's all, it's all hard-coded in the protocol, so the protocol needs to be aware of it. But with account abstraction, the protocol no longer cares. The network doesn't care how it, uh, how it happens, so it's abstracted from the network. It's not abstracted for the user. So for user, it's a concrete, it's a concrete functionality. It's not abstract. Therefore, I like to call it uh, smart accounts rather than... Uh, when talking to users, it's a smart account. It's not account abstraction. And the idea of account abstraction is as old as Ethereum itself. So Vitalik wrote the first post about it in, uh, in uh, 2015, uh, a couple of months before Ethereum launched. And since then, uh, researchers have been working on it for, uh, for about nine years now, which uh, makes it uh, pretty much the holy grail in Ethereum. And it's, uh, it takes... A, it's been taking uh, very long to figure out how to, uh, how to do it right. In the, in the early days of account abstraction, with some contract wallets, we, s we learned some security lessons that are uh, worth keeping in mind, such as the Parity wallet that used to be the most popular one in 2017, and it got uh, hacked, it got hacked, and later also uh, completely frozen, costing uh, users a lot of money. So we learned that account abstraction uh, also has uh, downsides. It's, uh, it brings a lot of benefits and is worth doing, but it uh, opens a new kind of risk of a smart contract, like a smart contract bugs. So they need to be well audited. Then in, uh, in subsequent years, research accelerated. 
And in particular, the Quilt team uh, did a lot of research on protocol level account abstraction, trying to, uh, trying to, uh, move, uh, to move the ecosystem uh, through a protocol to account abstraction using a protocol change. We also learned that this is really hard. It's really hard to get consensus on it and to change the protocol. And we have a chicken and egg problem. You can, uh, in order to agree on what account obstruction looks like and understand that it's safe, we need uh, to gain some traction. We need to experiment. But, but on the other hand, you can't experiment with something that requires a protocol change because you can't do anything until the protocol supports it. So, and in parallel, we started seeing uh, some practical, uh, practical approaches. We started seeing wallets, uh, uh, wallets that uh, show what account obstruction can do, such as the Agnosis Safe or uh, Argent. They demonstrated things like social recovery and uh, many other capabilities, but they, uh, but, they, but they required a centralized relay in order to pay for the gas. So there was some centralization risk here. Now, in the past two years, we started taking a more practical approach to experimenting with, uh, with account abstraction uh, with ERC-4337. That's, uh, the idea is the, to make it an ERC, so you can start experimenting immediately on every EVM chain and not wait for a protocol change. Um, and so, and in the last year, when in the last year we started, uh, we started also seeing some layer twos, in particular uh, uh, zk rollups, using. Uh, adding a native account abstraction, basically taking the principles from ERC-4337, the same kind of uh, maple protection, but uh, apply it at the protocol level. And uh, this started an ecosystem of uh, new wallets that take advantage of this. So what is ERC-4337? It's ERC, uh, first of all, it's a full account abstraction. It means we abstract every aspect of the account. We abstract authentication, which means you can use any signature scheme you like, not just ECDSA. So uh, you can use, for example, uh, any device that, uh, so you can, use, uh, you can use your mobile device that has a secure enclave and signs transactions with your fingerprint, for example. And we abstract authorization, so you can authorize any, uh, so you can have any access policies you like. We abstract the replay protection, so you don't have to use uh, an incremental nonce, and it opens some interesting use cases, in particular for, uh, in particular uh, when it comes to privacy and multi-tenant wallets. Um, it abstracts gas payments, so uh, any contract can pay for the gas, and you can implement any logic that does it. And of course, execution is ab abstracted, which means that uh, you can have things like batching and. Uh, and things that are specific to, uh, to assisting uh, certain dApps, you can have them as part of the wallet. Um, now, all of this stuff couldn't, uh, all of this stuff was also possible using a smart contract account before we created a standard, but in a centralized way, using uh, centralized relayers. And the uh, key focus of the, a key focus uh, of the ERC is on uh, being censorship resistant and uh, fully decentralized. So there are no centralized components in the system. The system is a, it, it, it's a, it uses a mempool, a, a network of bundlers, so there's, no, uh, there's nothing centralized to be, uh, to be attacked. And uh, this has been, uh, like, most of the work on this uh, protocol was around uh, that security. Now, in order to make it, uh, to make it robust, uh, there are also multiple uh, client implementation, multiple implementations of the bundler written by different projects with different la in different languages, which, uh, which is a similar strategy to what we do with Ethereum clients. And uh, most importantly, no protocol change, which means that uh, you can start using it immediately on, ev on, a, on every EVM chain. And then, uh, and then layer twos, can start uh, can start adding it to the protocol level in a way that doesn't break compatibility for wallets. And this week we uh, this week we announced that it's available on mainnet and on. Uh, oh. <laughs> right. 
thank you. <laughs> so we, we, passed, we passed an audit with the Open Zeppelin and uh, no critical issues are found. We deployed, uh, we deployed the contract on Ethereum and on uh, many other networks, both uh, mainnets and testnets. So, it can start, so you can start using it. And there are already bundlers running, uh, running on these networks. So it's all waiting for you and you can start using, you can start deploying and uh, using stuff on, uh, on any network. Now, uh, I, know of, uh, I know of several wallets that are uh, in advanced uh, stages of uh, being built or even audited. So I think we'll see some uh, announcements about that soon. And to make it easier for, uh, for everyone to start uh, doing cool stuff using this, we also announced a grant round. Uh, the ESP, uh, the Ethereum Foundation is running uh, an account obstruction grant round. So if you're building something, uh, something unique and interesting using ERC-437, you could consider applying for a grant. You have the link here. I will also have it as a QR uh, in the last slide. And where, where do we go from here? So this is only the first step. We don't want it to always remain just an ERC. We want to, uh, we want to see things being done more efficiently at the protocol level. And we already saw some layer two starting to edit. And uh, on these layer twos, we see an emerging ecosystem of, uh, of wallets with much better usability than we have on other networks. So I think we'll see this trend continuing. And, uh, and, and uh, we'll see this trend continuing. We'll see more layer twos uh, adding protocol level account abstraction. And the fact that they will all use the same standard means that wallets don't need to worry about it. As a wallet developer, you don't need to think about how you support each network. You implement it once, and it works, and it works uh, everywhere. And by, by removing this uh, fragmentation, we allow, we allow uh, wallets to focus on having the best usability, the best security, having features for users. So it makes, it makes UX better for all of us, since wallets don't need to uh, they don't need to spend the, the efforts on this uh, on fragmentation and can really focus on user value. The end, the end, goal, is to, the end goal is to come full circle. And uh, as, I said, as I said, we, have the, we always wanted to have account abstraction at the protocol level, but it was hard to do. So now we are, so, uh, so now after gaining enough traction and starting moving layer twos toward the native account abstraction, Hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to move the entire ecosystem, even including uh, Ethereum layer one. Although this will uh, take much longer, this will take much longer to uh, to figure this out. Uh, but that's the but that would be the end goal, and I think I'm also out of time. So um, so I leave just a couple of minutes uh, for uh, uh, for questions here, and you have the QR here for uh, you have the QR here if you want to uh, look at the grant round. Thank you. So, questions? Do we have, so, do we have time for a couple of questions? Or? Uh, no. Uh -huh. Maybe, okay, one question. I don't know where the other person is. Okay, so, Maybe five. okay, yeah. Okay, so it seems we have a, a very little time for questions. So if anyone wanted to ask anything. Uh, so where exactly is the logic living for the account abstraction, you know, that the networks will validate that the transaction actually fulfilled? So the logic is in the account itself. The account is a smart contract. It has code. So you implement, you implement a, a contract that uh, has a validate function called validate user op. This function, uh, this function looks at an operation and, and says whether it's willing to accept it or not. So you can implement, for example, the signature scheme. Let's say you want to use a BLS, or you want to use BLS, or you want to use any other uh, form of uh, signing. You can verify it there. You can also verify the replay protection because the nonce is abstracted. You verify everything you need in order to decide that you are willing to accept this transaction, and then it gets executed by the protocol. 